So I'm Lee Cronin. I'm the Regents Professor of Chemistry at the University of Glasgow. I run a pretty big research group exploring complex chemistry and I try to think about how things got started in chemistry and biology and how to make ways to explore all of chemistry. And um, is there one, one uh, question in particular you ask yourself? Yeah, I think the question I ask myself a lot is, is why, and I suppose linked to that, how, uh, did basically the earth become living? And I'm an inorganic chemist, and the word inorganic is associated with dead or non-living, and organic chemistry is associated with living. So the question I ask, almost to make fun or to describe it clearly, is how did dead chemistry become living, or how did the inorganic world become organic. Put simply, where did biology come from on Earth? So what's the difference b between organic chemistry and biology? Well, um, that's, I can answer that in, in a very complex way, in a very simple way, but I would say that biology uses organic chemistry and it's able to build machines with, based on organic chemistry. And the ultimate machine that biology has built is the organic chemist, because then they can make more molecules. But this is a, ro a robot argument I'll talk about later. But biology predominantly is based upon organic chemistry. It's a very nice chemistry. All your DNA, all the, all the proteins, all your muscles, all built with organic chemistry and some inorganic stuff, some salt and all that to make it work. So but the main question you, have, you, you try to answer is, um, how do we create life from dead material? Yeah. Absolutely. If you imagine back to the when planet Earth got started, it was probably a fairly busy place. Asteroids, meteorites, lava, thunder, lightning. But it was dead. I, I think of it like a beach, like sand on a beach where there was nothing but the wind blowing it around. And what I say to people is, how does that sand on the beach, that inorganic dead stuff, turn into living stuff? To seaweed, to the fish, to the trees, to the grass, to the bacteria. What on earth happened? Literally, what on earth happened? <laughs> it's quite an interesting question because put so simply, um, it's a chemist's ultimate dream. Like, this is the question. What turned dead chemistry into living chemistry? This is the question. For me, yeah. Why, why did, you, did you raise that question? Well, I'm not the first to raise that question. Lots of people raise that question in their own, in their own way. I guess we all have a what is the meaning question, don't we? And we all, whether you're an artist or a composer or a filmmaker or an architect, I guess we all, there is all meaning in, in the things that we build and create. For me, I'm really fascinated by the fact that chemistry is extremely complicated, that organic chemistry is complicated, the way the biology works, disease works, molecules work, it's all complicated. And I can do stuff with my hands and my eyes, but it's complicated. So if I purposefully build something, I'm controlling my fingers, I can see my world. But what, how, how did that work without me? And so I wondered, what, what, are the step, what are the simple steps that lead to complexity? So for me, it's kind of that manifestation of, I, I, although I'm a chemist, I don't really understand very much chemistry. It seems quite complicated. Mm. <laughs> And I'd like to know where we start. Yeah, because now you add, add an aspect, and that's complexity. Um, uh, but but uh, where does it start with you trying to answer that question? Oh gosh, um, I guess in my in 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 the laboratory, I was always fascinated how I could make molecules make themselves. So what we try to do there's this thing called nanotechnology, and nanotechnology is bigger than a molecule, but smaller than a, than say um, a second hand or a spring in a very fine watch. So how can I get molecules to go into that nano world? Because then I can make nano machines. If I can make nano machines, then I can do all sorts of fascinating things. So as an inorganic chemist, I, I basically took sand, stuff as simple as sand, and all I did is I added acid to it. And when I added acid to certain sands, they turned into nano objects. And I was fascinated, how could those nano objects build themselves? 
And part of the training I got when I was doing my PhD and then after my PhD was explaining and exploring the self-assembly of sand. Literally, how could the sand castle build itself without the bucket? How could the grains of sand know that each other existed to build the castle? And I spent a lot of time looking at that. And maybe because I look back in time, it's easy for me to kind of say, oh, I was always interested in the origin of life and making new life. But I guess it started with a fascinating of just complexity in general. How could the castle build itself without a person or a bucket? So is, is, it, is it like, could this house have built itself? <laughs> no. And that's really it's got... too complex. Yeah. And well, it's not... Well, of course the house built itself. If you allow the human being... To be, because the really thing is now, I say to people, well, 747 is too complicated to spontaneously assemble. So many, yeah, so there is a problem with probability and there is a problem with complexity. If you say to a, ma a mathematician or a statistician that something is complex, they will translate that to as being improbable to happen on its own. I think they're wrong. I think it's not just improbable. I think the chances of it happening is zero. So I think the chances of impro some improbable things are happening are zero. Just because you put a number on it, it makes them feel better. But with a 747, there is a zero chance a 747 will assemble itself. However, have an origin of life, have human beings, make a 747. They then, the human being plus technology makes a 747. So clearly the probability isn't zero because 747s exist. Um, and I think that that's about this house. The house didn't form itself, a person did it. So when you then think about life, um, a life is a very interesting thing because it's a machine that can act on surroundings to conquer it. It's almost like for me, living matter is somehow superior to dead matter because it can literally... <laughs> oh, yeah, but, but if it's a problem, we, we, yeah, we will... Fine, 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 I'll do it for you, fine, fine. Yeah. So, so for me, it's really interesting about enslavement and stuff going on. Um, so this house did not build itself, a human being did. Okay, what built the human being? And that's why you go down from there, and then you go backwards and backwards and backwards down to say, what is the simplest thing that could happen by chance that could make more sophisticated things happen? So this is where all the notion of complexity came from, and the house and the, 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 the person. I often have say one thing, which is no origin of life, no biology, no biology, no biologist, n no biologist, no human being, no, no philosopher, no philosophy. <laughs> I'll try and say it in a bit of a more elegant way later. But it, and that's kind of interesting. And so quintessentially what I'm saying is that you and I, we human beings, we see the world and we make a pat, we, we understand the world, we, we perceive it. So what is it about the stuff in me, the atoms in me, that allow me to appreciate the world? That is a really interesting phase transition. The sand in that castle is not aware of itself. But you add some complexity to it, and a few billion years of evolution, and you have a, not, a human being. So how did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's a step in complexity. Um, and so what, and I mean, we can go right down to the history of it. Look, but, but can you describe the complexity? So on this, on this uh, uh, level you are doing your research, uh, um, so you are trying to find the building blocks or, the, or the, 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 where it all started, the, the, dead, the dead parts? Yeah, so, my, so there's lots of, I don't know if you want to go down this part, depending. I'll let you guide me. But if you let's go back to the origin of life. Or well, people often talk about trying to work out the origin of life. I think it's a really important problem. There is more money and time being spent on the origin of the universe and the origin of mass, i.e., that's the Higgs boson and gravity, than the origin of life. There has never been a big project for the origin of life. But if I could understand where life came from. Or if I could, and this is my objective, to make new life in my lab, I could then tell you if li alien life is possible, <laughs> the constraints for new life forms, and I could expand the chemistry, the chemical space, beyond what we know already. And we could talk about the shadow biosphere and new types of life forms. So that's a really important problem. 
The problem with the origin of life is that it's his historical question. So lots of people go back and say, first assumption, origin of life took billions of years. Well, no, everyone's saying, well, no, maybe just a billion. I say, well, why a billion? Chemistry occurs much faster than the billion years. Evolution takes a long time, we know that. And then when you think about the problem, so if complex chemistry didn't take a billion years, how long? 100 million? 200 million? What about a year? What about if you could go from sand to a primitive cell in a year? What would that change? And then, then you say, okay, people say, no, that's impossible. And then you say, why? And they say, well, origin of life was clearly improbable, clearly impossible. We are clearly a fluke. We are clearly an accident. But that, that's also a very, that's not tested. So the fact we are here, the first assumption I make is that we're easy. Life is easier than you think. Uh, wait a minute. We're, we're, we, are, we are easy. We are easy. Our, you mean our life, our form of life? Our intelligence, or is it? The no, I, oh, no, 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 no. So I think there are three problems I'm really interested in. First of all, is that how to make a new life form. Second one is how can that life that single so how, does it is it a single cell or something? Then how does that life form become cooperative to make a multicellular creature? Because actually that took a billion years. <laughs> that did take a very long time. Could we speed it up? And thirdly. What happens to that multicellular creature to make it intelligent? It had to have a brain and then have sensors. Yeah. So I think the origin of life might be much easier than we think. Multicellularity might just take time. And then the real magic might be how we get to intelligence. Yeah. But I just would like to, I'm a chemist, and I would just like to answer the sand to cell question, or the dead to life <laughs> first. And I don't have 100 million years. I don't maybe have a... A thousand years, I might have 10 years or 20 years. So what can I do in my laboratory to speed that up? And what assumptions can I make? And if I make those assumptions about time and complexity, does it allow me to say something really obvious? Like, well, you know what? Let's say it was simple and let's assume it took no time. No, took no time. What do we then do that opens up the entire chemical space? So let me take a few steps back. And I'm trying to visualize your uh, lab. What is happening there? What are you doing there? The, what, <laughs> you answer this first, uh, your, your first question. Wow, what am I doing in my lab? Oh, yeah, so my lab uh, um, now is really exciting because it combines expertise I've been dreaming of getting together for a decade or actually probably as long as... as you, for 32 years, since I was 10 years old. Because it combines people who can play with computers. It combines robots. It combines chemistry. It, can, it com combines vision. And what we're trying to do in one half of the lab is we're trying to do really good chemistry to make new molecules. In the other half of the lab, we're trying to build robots that will do really simple chemistry to build really simple molecules. And we're trying to say, look at that chemist over there, they're amazing. Look at that, com that robot over there. That's really dumb. How can, we, how can we make the dumb robot as smart as the smart chemist? And what does that mean? Is there something the, chem the robot that can do is simple that can get smarter? And so at the moment, we've got a number of approaches. The first approach is what I call bottom-up. Sand to sandcastle. So we are basically shaking the sand in a, in a bucket. And we're hoping that the grains collect together to build something miraculous. And we can do it to some degree, but only small miracles, no big miracles. And we're finding something really interesting, that small miracles can have bigger miracles and have bigger miracles. So this is like what we call templated-based self-assembly. If, if you think of a, I want to make an arch ray in a bridge, I want to make a bridge across a river, one way of doing it is to build an arch. But to build an arch, you need a template for the arch you can make out of wood. But what if I could make the template out of arch form spontaneously to film the bridge? That's kind of nice. And so suddenly the arch builds the bridge. And in my lab, we're trying to make sure that we can do that. And we've found a way of a, a molecule makes its own archway. And then it makes the bridge. And then the archway dissolves. And all you see is the bridge. 
And the chemist's like going, where did the bridge come from? I didn't build the arch. And we caught the archway literally with its trousers down by accident. Like, there. Snapshot. And then we understood that. So that's what we call bottom up. Do you have another example of that one? Just to, to understand, because you, you tell me about the yep. sand yep. becoming the castle, but the sand, is that, the, the uh, do you mean the molecule? No, I mean the grain, the grain of sand. The grain of sand. Just the, that sand castle is made up of sand, yeah. and all, to make a sand castle, you can do one of two things. You could position each sand with a microscope by, ha by hand, it would take you a long time. You could get a bucket with the right indentations and just scoop the sand and put it in there. Or you could program the sand to self-assembly, like ants. And somehow, how do you, what are the smallest rules you can come up with? Um, and it's a bit like uh, trying to work out those rules. So another archway. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that's a hard one, another archway that would do itself spontaneously. Well, you have to, it, it's for me to understand. It's a bit like a, a, so making a snowman. So we made a snowman outside of my son the other day. And it's a bit like um, our snowman was made up of four snow balls. And we started rolling the snow together to make a big ball. So we just rolled the snow for maybe 10 minutes. And we got a ball that was basically half a meter stop. Then we ro rolled it for less time and we got maybe a quarter of a meter put on top and then another one for basically half of a quarter of a meter on top so we had fat less fat so a snowman so here's a way of doing it is to say could I allow a stone at the top of the hill to roll down the hill get enough snow to become a big ball and then split into two to make another ball and then they would assemble at the bottom it could happen randomly if you did enough times and that and, and that's what we're kind of doing in the lab, setting up random snowballs to make. Say, oh, there's a snowman. But there's a snowman. Can we, let, can we try enough times throwing the stone round, down the hill? So gravity plus snow, roll, snowball, snowman. Now, the interesting thing is you know, we need to make that simple enough. And then, but then when the snowman is able to build itself... This is in the magic. This is when life starts. So what is the minimum thing you can do to make something that can make itself? So what is it? So it's like, how can you start the ball rolling quite literally? And this is, so this is the bottom up. But that's very hard. We don't know where to search. And you're quite right to be, con not confused, but it's a big prob probability problem. How many lottery tickets do I have to play until I win? So that's bottom up. Top down is me being control. I'm building robots that I will control to build everything like atom by atom. And what we do is we then ask that we give the robot the instructions. We give it some knowledge, some information. So we say to the robot, we say to one robot, you're dumb, make a molecule, make a, snow, make a snowman, keep going. How many goes? How many goes? How many goes? We take another robot and say, here's a picture of a snowman. Make it. So the robot goes, uh, 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 made a robot. Then when we look at the robot, we say, okay, that's a really good snowman. We're now going to remove some of that information, but we still want you to make a snowman. How much information can we take away? So this is like top down. And what we're trying to do is work out how much information do we need to know and how much can we find? And it's the whole concept of information in biology. So it's a bit like how much randomness can we use or how much complexity can we get from our environment and it just goes back to an observation about biology biology um, that all living things are made of cells and in every cell there is dna and the dna al uh, allows the cell to evolve but no dna no evolution dna is complicated so where did the dna come from so what we're trying to do is look at the robots to help us guess that. And that's what we're doing in the lab. So we have two extremes. We have the random plus get lucky and the no random, let's big brother it. So we have like our big brother robot that videos everything and orchestrates. So we have the conductor and we have the free form no conductor. 
And um, th those two experiments you, you take on at the same time? We, they're going on in the group at the same time and we're using common people to look at the experiments, yeah. Yeah, so um, um, what can I imagine when I, when I see this experiment or experiment, this uh, research project um, with uh, the luck? How do you uh, manage to, um, to direct the luck? So here's the thing. One of the big top things that, that chemists are beginning to understand, well, it's like spread betting. Spread betting. You go, bet, you go and bet on a horse, you could bet on the winner or the loser, or you can spread on a, a, a variety of outcomes and say, right, I'll get money that way. I won't make money as fast, but I'll make money. If your objective is like, if I give you, I don't know, how many euros or pounds and say, right, you, your objective is to double your money in two hours. You could, if you're lazy, you could say, right, all on one horse and you'd be dead or, or win in very quickly. Or you say, okay, I'm not sure, but I'll make a spread. And so one of the things that we try to do is look at how we can look at the distribution of different, um, how we can spread our, our luck. So you can do that by um, doing lots of things at once. So what I'm trying to say is time is the enemy because it, it, to get lucky, you need to wait times. So if you do one at a time, it will take a long time. If you want to use the same amount of time, but get lucky quickly, you spread bet. In my lab, we don't have that much time, so we spread bet, it's like parallel. And um, what we're trying to do is to say, okay, we want to set up a series of random experiments, but we want to, because we can, because we could do the experiment in one big, say, a swimming pool sized reactor, or we could do it in a very small cup, or a test tube, or we could do it in a smaller. If we have lots of small test tubes, then we could do lots of different experiments in the same space as maybe a swimming pool. So suddenly one swimming pool could be cut up into one million or even more test tubes. So suddenly we have a million goes where we had one. Now take it into a droplet, like an oil droplet you'd get in your salad dressing, and we do all the experiments, one oil droplet per experiment, suddenly you can do a trillion experiments where you only had one. So you have a trillion goes. And then very quickly you could calculate how many times do I need to play the lottery before I get lucky. And in the UK, I think a few weeks ago, to win the 33 million, the probability I think was something like 256 million to one. Cool, with a trillion I can do that over four times. Here I go, I win. I have four, four chances of winning in that experiment. And that is how we do it. Go on most important question how do you define life okay that before i define life i'm going to define something else because it will be really important to understand why definition is useful many scientists think that life cannot be defined and i think that is unhelpful for trying to explain it to other people and also um, to try and get a concept because sometimes defining a concept you don't quite understand yet the one i like is flight Imagine before humans flew, they said, right, what is flight? And you go outside and look at birds flying, maybe. You might look at those squirrels that can glide, or bumblebees. And you can say, okay, this is, I have this notion of flying. There's some do um, work against gravity, and they can move air, and they go in the air. But when the first aeroplane was made by the Wright brothers, or whoever, because <laughs> I don't know, they flew a few yards. So it wasn't very far. But then people went, oh. Flight is powered, he heavier than air travel, uh, not just balloon flight. And because I could go 100 yards, now I worked out how I could go 1,000 yards. And then when I went 1,000 yards, I went across the Atlantic. Before you know it, we, got, we, we know what flight is. For me, flight is getting on an airplane, going up into the sky, coming down again safely, and being able to travel several thousand miles in the air without touching down. And I think by framing it this way, if we define life in a similar way, it might help us because now flight takes lots of different forms. We have rockets, we have planes, we have gliders, we, have, we may even have all sorts of other ways of doing it, helicopters. So when it comes to what um, life is, life seems to be a, um, an object. When you feed it, it multiplies. 
And that's one thing. Sorry, I had to stop. So I will start with a very general, not very satisfactory concept, but it's basically an object that takes stuff, simple stuff from the outside as food and can make itself replicate. And a fancier way of saying it is a self-sustaining, it's a bit like a flame that can feed itself, thing um, that can basically, that can evolve. But let's make it even more um, precise and just say life is a non-trivial self-sustaining thing in a big universe. Now, let me, there's a couple of scientifically, so non-trivial means that it's not like a bit of sand. It's complicated. That means that um, you'd have to write down some lines in a book to write down what it is. Um, uh, Self-sustaining means it can keep going. That non, that complex thing keeps going. So it's a bit like, uh, say, the storm on Jupiter that's been whirling around for these thousands of years um, uh, in the universe. So now can you see that life at that level, to me, has very little to do with chemistry. And here's the problem. Lots of people who are trying to make or understand the origin of life are being very specific in their chemical archaeology. But I'm just looking for a process. So I want to make the simplest object that will self-sustain itself be complicated and go around the universe. <laughs> so in my test tube, I want to make a blob or a cell that is able to make itself so when you feed it food and is complicated that just didn't just randomly arise. Because if I, if I say life is salad dressing, like I shake some vinegar and some oil and I get, you know, nice balsamic vinegar and I get this nice looking thing well that people could say well look, that looks like life form but it doesn't make itself it's not complicated it doesn't doesn't act on itself a higher level definition of life one that I like in the end is like is one that can act on itself to change itself what does that mean well I'm ill I've got a headache I can go and I can pick up a pill and take it and cure my headache. So I can do something from the outside to the inside. When you look in your environment, you don't, think, you don't see dead things purposefully moving around. So we call this agency. It's almost a bit like a, um, a self-awareness. So a sheep will go from grass, you know, to pasture to pasture. A dog will go and follow its master or, you know. So there's like these inputs, but I think they're quite complicated things. So I, I do like this idea of a complex thing that self-sustains in a big universe. So that... That, that... that it can, uh, can conserve itself. Yeah, so it copies itself that over time there's more of itself, that basically can take raw materials and become more complicated. And I, I guess these, no, these are notions, it's a bit like flight, because everyone, everyone tends to fight about definitions of life because, you know, um, we thought we, we could make a list of things, right? It needs to evolve, like Darwin, Darwin, right? It needs to be based on carbon, right? It needs to have water, correct, right? It needs to have a certain... And then you get write this list, and the problem is the list gets so long, you forget why you're writing the list. And so I go back to flight and say, well, what is it interesting about flight? Well, for me, I want to get on my airplane. I want it to take off safely and travel several thousand miles, touch down and we get off, refuel going. So although, so flight means something to us. So if I could make a new life form based upon different chemistry, that would be really interesting because suddenly we don't have to say it's based on carbon or water because suddenly I'm now looking for a complex thing that's self-sustaining in a universe but it doesn't have to be based on carbon or water and that's kind of where we're going at the moment and the, it's not a finished um, definition and it may never will be but think back before flight before aeroplanes um, we didn't have anything else to reference now we could all agree if we went to see some objects you know a parachutist or whatever what would be a what would be flying or not 
So I'm hoping that if we can make new life forms with different chemistry, it would help us under identify new life. Maybe there's other life forms on the earth that are very simple that we don't understand or we haven't recognized because they're too simple. We just ignore them. But that's a big giant leap ahead. Um, I, 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 I guess. I, 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 would, I would say potentially, but maybe not. <laughs> I think maybe not. But what, what are you actually doing in this lab? To, to, just to prove that your guess is right. Well, I think that's a very important question. But um, what we're trying to do, so many people are, not, are saying we need to design or we need to select a very special chemistry. And only a very special chemistry can lead to life and biology. So very special chemistry, living or origin of life and biology. I'm trying to say the other way around. Maybe the process is more important than the chemistry. And the process selects the chemistry it needs to become alive. Now bearing that in mind, suddenly we go to the lab now, we're suddenly free. We don't just have to use DNA, amino acids, the things that you find in biology. We can use sand. We can use salt. We can use other stuff. So what we're trying to do is to take the simplest molecules, the simplest chemicals, and shake them together and look for evidence that they will become complicated to start to become self-sustaining. We want to look for phenomena like forming cells. We we'll look for making machines. Look for evidence of complexity. And so if I could basically take some very simple molecules and they would turn themselves into a cell that could self-replicate and look like a bacterial cell under a microscope, then that would be really interesting. And one yeah, of the... That means that you're right. Well... If you find that, that, but you must have a clue that you are going to find. No, that. I don't... No, I, well, what, so, no, I don't have any clue, but I think I'm right because if I think, well, if, I th if you think back to the early Earth, early Earth was really crazy. Like every day that goes by, there's fire, there's brimstone, there's asteroids hitting, the water's being evaporated, there's lava coming out, the energy's really high. So any really sexy, sophisticated chemistry will be erased in a second, or it would be erased. And this is my epiphany that I saw, you know, maybe when I, when I think about, because I obviously like um, water, because I'm in Scotland and it's raining all the time. But if you look at it in the river or in the sea and you look at patterns and things and they're only there for a small moment in time. So if the pattern was going to be erased really quickly, life is a pattern that doesn't get erased. It takes um, the outside and makes a pattern and makes more of itself and replicates that pattern. And life is a bit like the Olympic flame. It's that that organization that goes from thing to thing to thing in time and space that never gets erased because it keeps being replicated. So if that could happen on Earth, I reasoned it has to be a happen much easier than we thought because otherwise the complex chemistry would be erased by the meteorite, the water boiling, the fire and brimstone. So my simple notion, if I'm being brutally honest, really honest is that, and I'm being really honest because I don't have any cognitive reserve, is that I feel that life is far simpler than we could possibly imagine. And I think we can recreate it in lots of different chemistries. And there's no secret. There are lots of origins of life on planet Earth. One origin of biology that we know today. So there are lots of roots, there are lots of ways to make a life form. And they all converged and they cooperated and they ended up with DNA and proteins and ourselves as a compromise, if you like, between all the different um, extremes. You know, uh, mini disc player, iPod, tape cassette, all these different technologies that were competing. It was the same in chemistry, I, I think. I, I almost say I believe. I guess it is a belief because beliefs are those things that can't yet be tested. <laughs> And obviously, I'm trying to turn that belief into a scientifically falsifiable set of experiments. And so we're going from two extremes. What I talk about top down with a robot doing it and the bottom up, allowing it to happen and then videoing it. 
So, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the simplest chemistry that can show evidence of becoming self-sustaining and um, complex. So it's a bit like, how simply can we make a fire that's able to go and find its own fuel, but this fire has a pattern. Maybe it's not just a flame, but it's a word. And let's say the word fire. Let's say the word fire can write fire. And that wor word fire can pep go from... And that's what we're looking for in the lab. If that analogy makes sense. I can try and think of a better one in a minute. No, 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 it makes sense. Very good, very good. This is a very good explanation you gave right now. Uh, because of the, uh, um, well, I understand, <laughs> and I hope now the viewers do, because of this element of complexity, some complexity is added, and then things evolve and things start to develop, and uh, it still is, is a coincidence, and it, and it has various roots, uh, various chemical roots. Um, so I understand it very much, um, but how do you um, how, how, how do you try to catch this coincidence so i was just thinking about it when i was talking when you were talking just there it's like extreme trial and error i'll tell you something which i found one of the most beautiful things i've ever done as a parent or my wife has done as a parent it was a gift we were given which was basically grow your own butterfly and so you have this kit where you have these things that turn into caterpillars and they have their own food and they go around and you watch them go through the process. The caterpillars eat the food. They then make chrysalis and you put them in a, in a little um, net and they go up and they're ready. And after some time, the butterflies come out. But when we did it, we had five and we were really emotionally attached. And the kids were like, look at this butterfly, it's coming. But the fifth one got tangled in its wet, in its like uh, silk. And it never made it free, it died. And we were so, we were trying to cut it free and we were so upset. But then we were like, ah, oh, that's a perfect thing about life. It's trial and error. Those that survive continue. And if you think about trial and error, life is nothing more than matter that helps itself through trial and error. And it's a bit like the selfish gene, but it's more primal than that. It's more simple. And to put simply, what is the simplest sand or dirt or rocks that can help other rocks get better? And what is the definition of better? The problem with life, though, or the nice thing about life, as we were talking earlier, and again, it's complicated now, but for something to be alive, it has to die. And there's a kind of simple thing. You will know when... And uh, uh, let's say a bacterium is alive and it's dead. When it's dead, it's no longer able to grow, reproduce. You know when a bacteria, if you feed it food, every 20 minutes it splits into two, into two, into two. And it's really interesting, that, that point of a bacterium. This is, imagine, a bacterium. And then in 20 minutes does this. So I ask you a question. In your, in your, in your stomach, or in your intestine, you have lovely bacteria that look after you. Or you have your bacteria, whatever you want to call them, your microbiome. How old are the bacteria in your intestine? I really have no idea. I would say roughly 3.9 billion years. Because that bacteria came from one bacteria, they came from one bacteria, came from, and there is an Olympic torch of information passed back to what we call Luca, the last universal common ancestor. Isn't that wonderful? The last universal common ancestor. It's from the cell from which all other cells on earth originated. It's that Olympic torch that was then copied. But it wasn't just one Olympic torch that was carried from athlete to athlete. They copied it. So it's a bit like then suddenly copying a photograph or, I don't know, a, a, something that goes viral on the internet, everyone watching it. So that bacteria in your intestine is billions of years old you are billions of years old because where do you come from you came from your parents where do they come from their parents where do they come from and then for evolution before then maybe from the primates and then from before that and all the way back isn't that interesting that you persist in time but you die 
And so, it, and, and, and okay, it's different for bacteria because they never quite die. They, they're like, they split into two, split into two, but it's a change in cycle. So it's this trial and error. And so it's another way of setting up what's the minimum trial and error I can set up to carry on going. Um, and I still, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I don't know what it means. People say, well, what is it? I'm like, well, I kind of know what I'm looking for, or I'll know when I see it. But what I need to do right now is start with really simple chemistry in the lab. And I need to watch it like a hawk until suddenly something really odd happens. And I go, they're the events. Those events are responsible for the origin of life or maybe a new life form. And so I guess it's really that is it. I mean, what I'm doing is actually extremely simple. I'm just playing dice. Keep rolling the dice, rolling the dice. I want basically not just to get one six but six sixes in a row and then I want to keep going and then I want to preserve the motion I must play to get those six sixes in a row. Very good. I understand it very well now. So, it, it, practically, how do you do this in your lab? <laughs> I, um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying, uh, I, I would like you to tell about, well, we have this machine, a robot. And yeah, this. yeah. So we have, again, with two ways. I, because I do a lot of inorganic chemistry, inorganic, I, I assemble really complex molecules from simple molecules. And, um, and the way I do this is I add acid to salt. And normally it's boring, but in my lab we can make it be interesting. So that's what we're doing right now, is we're looking at how to make the most complicated molecules with the least instructions. And with the robot, the same. We are giving it some chemistry to do, but we're saying, what about if we give you the least instructions? What is the most interesting thing you can do with the least instructions? And then when it does nothing, which it does at the moment, they say, okay, I give in. I give you the full instructions. What happens when you have all the instructions? What can you then do? And then that's what we've done. And, and we'll, I'll show you this in the laboratory. We've made a robot that you can give it instructions and it makes really complex oil droplets that look like they're alive. But they're not alive, they just move a lot. They were orchestrated. It was a cheat, a setup, a bribe, whatever. <laughs> but then we say, okay, because we, we, we know what instructions we needed to do to make the droplets look alive, how can we now move the information from the robot to the, the chemistry? And it's a bit like this. We are saying we want the robot to write Shakespeare or the equivalent complex poetry song. Now, because the robot's dumb, it doesn't know Shakespeare, so we have to tell it Shakespeare, so it just copies it. And then if we blot out certain amounts of Shakespeare, we say, okay, write Shakespeare with this small fragment. And then when we say, right, okay, now you know no Shakespeare, but learn a little bit of English and see if you can make something that sounds like Shakespeare. What do you need to go through to make that? And I think that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do. I know it sounds kind of intangible. It's like still, you're kind of expecting me. Now, what we are doing in the lab, um, which is even to start somewhere that... What we are doing in the lab to start somewhere simple is we say, right, biology is made up with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, sulfur, and some other metals. What we're doing is we're putting these elements together and we're zapping them with electricity and we're heating them. We're saying, what do they form? So we're taking hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water. And we're doing a very classic experiment which was first done in the 1950s called the Miller-Urey experiment. And they got two electrodes to simulate lightning and they got this simple soup and they heated it. Very simple, very simple elements, very simple molecules. And what they got when they did it, and they did it for four or five days, that in the end, in that soup, in the primordial soup, they got some oil. So it looked like gloopy grued oil but they saw some acids in it, some molecules that look like amino acids. And they got really excited because amino acids are what you find in biology, in your proteins. They are the simplest molecules. So everyone went, oh, the problem is solved. 
just methane, nitrogen, uh, you know, sorry, just methane and hydrogen and ammonia and some flame and some fire and you can make amino acids. But those amino acids are really simple and they're in really low concentrations. There's a very small amount. So even though people have tried to since the 1950s, for almost the last 65, 66 years, people try to turn those amino acids into proteins and they have failed. What we've just done in the last year is we've made a robot that takes those simple amino acids and does random chemistry with amino acids. And we've seen how primitive proteins can emerge. Or they're not proteins, I must be honest, they're protein-like, but they can emerge from the random chemistry. So you have a clue. We have a clue, and we used a robot to do it. And I realized the question you're asking, because if I were like, like, what? You're in sand, I'm bored of sand, I'm bored of salt. What are you doing? Hydrogen, carbon, ammonia, some flame, amino acids, really simple building blocks. Those building blocks we then put into a robot to basically shake in a different way. So, well, what's the difference between you and this, uh, this year uh, 50 uh, experiment, experiment? Very important thing is that we then take the material from the Miller-Urey experiment, which was just in a, in, a, in a vessel, and we then used an algorithm to order the, to simulate lots of different environments, because in a bell jar, there was no sand, there was no earth's crust. It was just, it was sanitized, it was dead. It wasn't complicated enough. The earth was quite complicated. There are minerals, there's the surface, there was some atmosphere. So what we did is we put everything into different building blocks. Sorry, start again. We put everything into different vessels and we treated it a different way. So we did lots of random experiments and we looked for organization. So what we did was we made a massively parallel Miller-Urey combination. So we took the building blocks from the Miller-Urey and we divided it into literally a thousand different pots. This is like, how do you make a cake from random recipe, random ingredients? Well, you could randomly throw them again and just do one oven and you'd make nothing. Or you could get somewhere where you make a dough and then you say, okay, I'll put it into a thousand cake pots and put them in the oven and see which rise and select the ones which rise and look nice. And that's what we did. Looks like, sounds uh, like an enigma machine. Yeah. It's exactly an enigma. You are, this is really good. So here's the thing. The enigma machine was a code breaking machine. And I look like the origin of life is an enigma machine. The code, the code that came from the enemy was in the environment. Everyone can see it. But the sequence, the DNA, if you like, was not known. So we had to ha find that random code by guessing or to plug it in. If we plug it in, we know the solution instantly. Or if we guess, we have to take many, many goes. And that's exactly it. You could view the origin of life like an Enigma machine. And we just do not know the cipher. Or we don't know the key, sorry, to, to type in. And actually, I, sent this, I said this to a complexity theorist who's interested in decryption and encryption. He said, yeah, that's right. In fact, if we know all the program on Earth, by knowing the life form, or knowing how we could work backwards and work out the keys. And it's a bit like how you do encryption today. So you could view it like that. And so life suddenly, even though I'm a chemist, life suddenly takes on a meaning that is not based in chemistry. It's in information. What about, what is now the magic information I can give you to go away and build a whole new society. So I sent you to Mars. Which one book would you take to make oxygen, water? Have you seen The Martian? Maybe we shouldn't talk about films on this. No, I, don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it, but I, I'm certainly... So amazing. here's an interesting thing. In the end, the way human beings will expl escape planet Earth is they will send out robots that will go to other planets and they will look for a resource and they will turn that resource into a living algorithm to make more of itself, to make a living machines. And that's what we'll do, I guess.
but that, that, that makes you the new, um, I forgot his name. The man, the man who, cr who, cr who cracked the, co the Enigma code. Then the cheering. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the work we're doing is inspired by cheering. I mean, cheering, <laughs> given what just happened today, I'm not sure I want to talk. Both Turing and Boltzmann both committed suicide. Boltzmann committed suicide because no one understood what he was talking about and was really shunned by the environment, shunned by the society. Turing committed suicide for reasons that were complicated. He was homosexual. He was victimized. He was bullied. He was pushed out. He had, anyway. Um, but Turing really inspired, well, both Turing and Boltzmann inspired me, not because they committed suicide, but because they really had very interesting handles on a very complex problem. Boltzmann talked about disorder. He knew about randomness. And he worked out this thing, this measure of randomness called entropy. Basically, my kids, when they go into their bedroom, they go... <laughs> and if their entropy is high, it, i.e. if it's very random, they've worked hard and made it random. It's like what happens when heat goes out. If I go in and I order everything, I decrease the entropy. So I then, the nice thing when I decrease the entropy, I give it a chance to be disordered again. Turing understood this also, but in a different way. He came up with an idea called morphogenesis. And when I go running now, when I'm thinking for years, for me, what has inspired me and drives me, and I think that, because of course, everyone says to me sometimes when they're making fun, I don't have any original ideas. I'm desperate to have an original idea, but maybe I haven't yet. It's just a synthesis of other people's ideas. For me, I want to come up with chemistry that undergoes morphogenesis. So if I can, and morphogenesis is like a, an object that can change shape and change function, but still be the, but still be it itself. And I guess what I would say to you, maybe the viewer is like, what is, what defines yourself? You wouldn't go out and look at a rock and say, oh, that's a self, but you would go out and look at a a deer or a goat or a child or an animal and say, oh, that's a self. It controls. A living thing is a thing which can then actually observe itself and walk and talk and move. It's not only that, because bacteria can't walk and talk and move in the same way. They certainly move, but it's more crude. So there is something interesting about what Turing thought about and decryption, decryption and computers and robots and so on. And in the end, I'm pretty sure that human beings will be able to make a robot that will be able to make itself. And, but I'm anxious that we don't forget the origin of life. Because one day, maybe... In this robot. Well, maybe. Here's a story. Let's imagine the human beings are long gone and there are only robots. And the robots make themselves and the robots go to another planet. And there's a robot society. And there's a supernova that erases the memory. And um, the robots forget where they come from. Where do we come from? So they start the origin of robot life. They're grinding silicon chips up in beakers. Like, where did the chip come from? It's not self-assembling. And they forgot that they're a complex machine made by a more simple machine. Made by a more simple machine. And so if I can tell you anything today, which I think for me, I can't really justify, but my feeling is life started with a minimal machine that can make a slightly more complicated machine that can make a slightly more complicated machine. And so, yes, it's turtles all the way down, but they're simpler until the, the turtle right at the bottom is just sand and water. And at the end we have, I don't know, pornography. Well, because, I, you know, this is like I say, I mean, one of my friends who's looking at robot culture, that's the ultimate, the ultimate form of a robot culture will be robot pornography that they all share. But maybe you don't want to put this in the main movie, I don't know, the main documentary. But I think your comment about Turing is very perceptive. Um, I'm certainly inspired by him. I'm certainly inspired by a lot of people that looked at informatics. I think one of the, I'm one of the first synthetic chemists to be sufficiently inspired by information and say, how can I do minimum, how can I come up with a minimum information but get the maximum chemistry? And what are the things we're doing and where we're going and how I kind of got to this is 
we're trying to discover new drugs in my lab and make new drugs. And if the viewer is completely confused about molecules and drugs and life, I'll, I'll give you one interesting thing. I don't know if you know about the antibiotic problem. <laughs> can, uh, can beat the drug. They can out evolve using natural selection. The drug doesn't use natural selection, so it relies on the human being to make a new drug. In my lab, one of the reasons why we want to make an artificial life form is if we can make drugs that are in competition with the bacteria and we say, right, here's a new, here's a new bacteria, here's a new drug, dead. Oh no, our out evolve. And all we do now is there's no such thing as an antibiotic. There's only a generation of new antibiotics that can be made under pressure by the bacteria. So suddenly we change the entire concept of an adult, of a obsolescent drug. No antibiotics become obsolete because we have an evolutionary machine. So at the very worst, what we have made in my lab is not very good. So don't get excited. We haven't cured the antibiotic problem, but we have made an evolution machine that starts to show us how we can make some drugs evolve and beat some antibiotics. And when they out evolve the drugs, we do it again and keep going. And our dream is to make a machine that can evolve an endless, infinite pipeline of drugs. And when we understand that process, maybe we can understand how um, the life got started because it's an information-based argument. You know, I'm going to express myself. Isn't it wonderful the universe exists? Look at the glorious things that happen. And one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I get, I'm paid to ask why. That's what we do as well. We are also get paid to ask. And isn't that a wonderful privilege? And that is one of the reasons why I try and engage to tell people um, and why I try not to be arrogant about it because I don't feel a sense of arrogance. I feel, eventual, I feel and where I come from is a sense of profound dumbness or a profound insecurity about understanding myself and why I'm here. And, but I'm, I, I, I like to be creative. And so, you know, that's, it's, an, it's a privilege to do it. But if I can come up with, like we talked about the antibiotics earlier, and it's societal excuse, not to validate it, but if I can turn the idea into something really cool that could change humanity or be useful, then I think that's really excellent. Um, and one of the things that's one I want is obviously, better, I want to solve the problem. I want to make sure I'm useful and I want to understand more about the process. And so it's all kind of in, all complicated. It's kind of wo 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 woven together. Is it, is it the part uh, I want to do good and I want to be clever and I want to, I want to be uh, important? Or what is it? What kind of mix is it? No. When I was at school and um, the, the, uh, the teachers told me I was never going to really make it, beyond anything they said you're just not going to make it you're not smart they used to they used to say you're pretending to be smart stop pretending to be smart and i was like well what do you mean so well you're pretending to read I'm like okay you're pretending to do maths that we don't understand or you're pretending to i got the book out of the library and like they were like stop trying to fool us and i was like well surely it would be more effort to fool you than just to do it so if I was successfully fooling you, wouldn't that be mean I'm even smarter than just being able to do it? And they were like, just go away. <laughs> uh, so so um, I, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I can deal with imposter syndrome. A lot of people in science or anything who are good at stuff, athletes, everybody. In fact, all of us, we're all imposters to some degree. I mean, do we feel good enough? No, but that's why we try and do better. And so I become comfortable about people telling me I'm not going to succeed. But I, that doesn't mean I shouldn't try. So that's the really nice thing. No one thinks I'm going to succeed to make a new life form in my laboratory. I don't think you'll find anyone that believes I'm going to succeed. But probably I will. And, and for the simple reason, not for the complicated one. And the simple reason is because it's obvious and easy and not that complicated and going on already. Not for that I'm this magician who knows something they don't and I'm so incredibly smart and I'm this hidden genius. Clearly I'm not. <laughs> but you still think 
you will create life in in, in what time? Well, I, I made a mistake a few years ago when I gave a talk at TED, you know, when you're trying to give this, this TED Talks or these soundbite talks. They're a privilege to give and great, but you, you feel like you want to time, 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 time bound it. And I gave a time it would take. Once we knew what we were doing, I reckon we could do it quickly, you know, year, a few years. But then that, that kind of got misunderstood as, oh, you'll do it in two or three or four years. I don't know. <laughs> Um, when we make progress in, in one, two, three, four, five, ten years, I would hope so. Can I put a limit on it? No, because I don't want to raise expectations. But I think right now, it would be nice within the next ten years to know how hard the problem was. It will, let's say, if I can't do it in a decade or two, or if I can't convince other people to help me, because I think it's beyond me. I am not capable of solving this problem on my own. That's what I've realized. But maybe I'm capable of building a cooperative network to make a basically a large hadron collider of chemistry and, and make a, a chemical internet so that all chemists can exp explain their chemistry to each other and work together. If I can't do it, but they can't do it. And then so suddenly I then crowdsource chemistry through all my other labs and my competitors become cooperative and maybe that's a way of looking at it we turn it into a big cooperative end endeavor and we realize it's beyond one of us I, I, i'm sure i'm right like instinct says i'm right yeah I, then you, you have look i'm right i look right. okay okay if you want me to level with you i can't tell you why i'm right i'm right <laughs> and the job my job is you quite rightly as a skeptic should go no lee actually you're not right until you demonstrate the theory, the experiment, and the critique. And you carry on and you let everyone else judge. And your peers will judge if you're right. You won't. You're, so in a way, the nice thing for me is I like look, I say, I don't have to be right, I don't have to be wrong. I just have to do it. I say, here's my assumption, here are my experiments. Because you know what, when people believe they're right, and they just think everyone else is, uh, you know, oh, how dare you? give me a criti criticism, I'm right, you're just too stupid to understand, or you don't understand this, or you don't know that, there's something wrong. I see this all the time. So my job is to say, honestly, as much as possible, here are my starting points. Here are my rules for my experiment. Now I'll throw my die. Look how the experiment unfolds. And all I want you to do is go, wow, that's interesting. If I can get you to do that, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong, I will take a holiday or you know, glory in discovery. All I want to do more than anything else, the reason I'm doing this, the reason I think I'm right is I want to discover the process or the, the, the phenomena or the thing that it is that turns dead chemistry to living chemistry. And that for me, so I suppose I know I'm going to discover something is probably more what I can say with certainty rather than I know I'm right. And that's what I guess I'm trying to say. To be In the end, I don't know if I'm going to write. Maybe I will never be proven right or wrong in my lifetime because we won't have the tools or I'm, I, it's a near miss, but I lack the, the intellect. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe the computers aren't fast enough. The time is not long enough. But if I can start with sand and turn it into an object that starts to do something by itself when I feed it a fuel. And you go, wow, let's look at that again. And you see that spark of life in that previously dead object. That's really cool. What I think I might have been able to do is when those spark of life are set up, those sparks of life, those living things, can do stuff that dead things can't do. And they make artifacts a bit like a caveman or me would make a complex object that if you found in your backyard a thousand years later you go well naturally occurring or someone made that i think i have come up with a thing an algorithm as i would call it a measure of made upness <laughs> if i showed you a thing an object you could tell me using my rules whether a living system, a life form, made it or not. 
And that is what I'm most excited about right now, because that seems to be working in my head and I'm challenging it to all the skeptics I can find and they are trying to demolish it right now. And I think they will get somewhere, but there's something in it. And you're a year too early or you're right on time. <laughs> you can cut that out depending on whether it works or not in a year's time. And I think that in a year's time we will know. So if you bring me an object and if you go to, if I go to Mars, here's my phone. And you can see my phone's got a screen, it's got some of my boys when they were young at the dentist. And I find this on Mars. What do you conclude? If you go to Mars, you're the first person on Mars and you find one of these phones, what do you conclude? That you are not the first one. It's either a hoax, I'm not the first one, or a life form made of phone. You can't, it's either one or the other. So now, let's say we go to Mars and we find an object that's so complicated, it doesn't exist on Earth. We've never seen it before. It's not, a, it's not evidence of Apple going galactic or solar, what's the solar systemic, solar, Apple solar, you heard it here. <laughs> No, I just want, I want money from Apple. I want them to pay me to go solar. No, maybe Elon Musk can do that. If, so if you can find a complicated enough, these are called biosignatures. And what I've done is I think I've started to use it. I've written a new complexity theory, me, which I'm very proud of as a, someone in school who was never any good at maths, apparently. Well, I, I obviously not bad. I've written a new complexity theory with my research team. And it seems to give us biosignatures to tell us when something is as complicated or improbable as a phone. You bring me a molecule in your hand. I can tell you by doing a number of simple things to that molecule if it was made by a life form or not. How cool is that? Equally, if you say this house, was this house made by a life form or not? Yes. Your car, your phone. So... Now, I've now got a hierarchy of complexity, and now in the end, I can define complexity by life by complexity, the necessary complexity. It's a bit like life form, uh, life is those things that can throw six die, six sixes in a row every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. you explained that beautifully. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, is it possible for you that um, you, you discovered this mathematics or, or, or this explanation for, for um, how to recognize intelligence in a life form. Not intelligence, uh, or, or, uh, evidence of, com of a life form. Yeah. yeah, not intelligence. Here's the yeah. way I did it. But, no, but sorry, okay. is, it, is, it, is it like a, a, um, a code or how? how no, it, no, it's more, uh, it's even more brilliant than that. Oh no, I shouldn't say that. It's even more simple than that. I don't want to sound narcissistic on camera. It's even more simple than a code. Because a code requires... What is it? Oh, is it? It's a mo molecules. It's molecules. molecules. Uh, uh, and, and, so uh, a molecule... the name of the molecule? No, any molecule. So if you bring a molecule to me, I don't want to give too much away because it's not published yet. But it, oh, should, be pu it should be published. We, we but don't understand. So. Well... I is, could, it, is it something because I'm looking for something that when you are drawing your uh, on your window, you there is a threshold. There is a mol so here's a thing. Um, when you add sand together, you get certain patterns, and you get those patterns will be simple. It's basically how many grains of sand do I have to add together to get a pattern that is not randomly possible, and that is the beginning of the code in molecules. So if you imagine sand grains are atoms. When you throw them together, they join. There'll be a certain pattern of atoms that when joined together, if you can find that in the environment, that cannot spontaneously form because it's just too improbable. And that is it all, I think. And I'm super excited because now I don't need to make life just make life, I need to make the simplest machine that can make the most complicated molecule. So now I'm like, oh, 
I don't have to fly for the sake of it. Because flying, no one flew for the sake of it. They flew because they wanted to beat gravity and they wanted to get from London to New York. Now I have a reason for doing it. That's really important to have a reason for doing it. I, I, I can improve the complexity of the molecule. And more importantly than that, more important, is I can look on Earth or Mars or Europa. And, yeah. I can, and I can see if I can find molecules on these planets that are greater than the threshold of naturally occurring and to see if there is Martians or Europeans. Because while I could argue that life on Earth is too sophisticated, so it's become globalization. Let me tell you the ultimate globalization in life on Earth, DNA. Everyone has it. Aren't we boring? We all have DNA. It's like McDonald's. Oh, got McDonald's. Look at the golden arches. You all have to have a thing called a ribosome. A ribosome is a machine that turns your DNA information into the proteins. How boring is that? Everybody's been globalized on Earth. We all knew the same thing. Wouldn't it be great if on Earth we found other life forms that didn't use DNA? Wouldn't it be great if on Europa and on Mars we found other life forms that didn't use DNA, but they were still alive? They were above this threshold, and the only way we could recognize them is they were making really complex molecules. Now, you're talking about code. The reason I got excited is the reason why some of my friends in complexity science are, are excited is when, normally when you take any code or you take a picture, you have to sign a code to it. It's abstract letters. Well, for me, the code is written in the periodic table. The code is solved by the process of quantum mechanics. The code is embedded in the laws of the universe. So the identity, carbon or nitrogen or oxygen or sulfur, they are implicit. The code is already there. I don't add it on. So that means that the molecule that I think is complicated in, on Earth next to the sun is equally valid in Alpha Centauri, the planet next to that. And it's a universal code. It's the code of complex molecules. So if I send a space probe to somewhere else in the universe and it finds a complex molecule and it's different to what we know on Earth, then we can assume that it formed by chance, of which there is no chance. I've already explained. That it's no, just to take that as an assumption, even if you don't believe me, just say, okay, I will assume that Lee's assumption is correct. If this molecule couldn't form by chance, and it didn't come from Earth, another life form made it. That's it. That's what we're looking for. It sounds really exciting. <laughs> Suppose you find it. Um, uh, of course, when you succeed. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, <laughs> what will that mean to us humanity? Well, I th for me, it will be if we succeed, when we succeed, when we succeed, it will tell us that the universe has the propensity, the ability to live. And that we are not a fluke. So that we can breathe a high, huge sigh of relief. To say, you know what? Our pathetic little lives have some meaning. We are here. Now what meaning? Well, we impose the meaning on ourselves. The universe just is, right? I'm not looking for deep meaning anywhere. It just is. But then we can shift our entire problem. To like saying, okay, life is easy. What about complex life? How easy is that? And let's just say someone long after I die manages to do that and then say, okay, what about intelligence? How do we make that? And what does that mean? And um, I don't know, that's mind blowing. I mean, there's so many steps. I, I'm, 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 I'm a real practical guy. I'm a chemist. I love computers. The reason I, I got, you know, my son is nine years old, my oldest son. And last Saturday, I did something that my father did for me when I was nine years old. He bought me a computer. So I took my son and I bought him the Raspberry Pi, which is the well, the the Brit, the, the best-selling British computer ever. And I have to be true to British computer science because it's legend. I had a ZX81, 
And I bought him this Raspberry Pi. It was in a nice case with a keyboard, so he could do it. And he's programming basic. He's addicted. It's hilarious. And one of the things I loved about when I grew up, you know, when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, the, t the, the teachers were saying I was stupid, but I was programming and I was using assembly and trying to get as many programs into 1K. I was fascinated. I only had one kilobyte. How much mayhem could I cause with one kilobyte? So for me, it was like compression. How could I compress as much potential mayhem in 1K? And that's why I became obsessed with comp Complexibility, complex ability, <laughs> that's a new word, compression and complexity. How much mayhem could I compact into a small box? How do you uh, um, prevent yourself from uh, going crazy? Because all these things and thoughts and, and ideas and, and instinct together like uh, a giant chemical soup <laughs> <laughs> well i mean uh, um, what, what, what do you do b b besides thinking about this to j just to balance uh, your your i've always been balanced from the beginning i'm always a little bit on the the weird side in terms of i'm a little bit extrovert but but my family my it may sound my family came before my sight okay i mean or okay i talk about when i was a child but my progress into academia I was married before I was a professor. I was married before, then, and, and my wife is one of the smartest people I know. And she kind of, she's so dismissive. She's like, "Yeah, whatever. Now go do the washing up." Or you know, <laughs> "Yeah, you may be smart because she has a PhD in fundamental magnetism." So it's kind of grounding in a way in magnetism, quantum magnetism. So she was trying to understand how little magnets could order and undergo phase transitions uh, and long distance. And so, and you know, she like me. She was had an interesting. She was, she was the opposite of school. She was in a poor school, but the genius at school. So everyone thought she walked on water. So she was told she was a genius. Well, I was told I was a non-genius at school. <laughs> so I don't know. And we met. We met on a crystallography course, actually. Crystallography course, which is like a science course, understanding X-ray diffraction. Um, uh, years and years ago. I don't know. And I suppose. Um, I've never been. That's I'm real, I, real chemistry. Yeah, real chemistry. I guess. I mean, um, I don't know. There's something intrinsically grounded in my. Pra I'm a practical. It's practical. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the reason why it's grounded. It's all very practical. It's like a lot of people go crazy because it become more and more abstract, and like, oh, you can't possibly understand how complicated it is in my head and all this. So yeah, probably you can't, and probably you can, but at the end of the day. And this is why one of the things I'm doing in my research group at the moment is I'm really privileged. I have so many smart people. And their challenge, I probably can't use the word retard in America or some places. The stupid person in the group is me. If they can't explain to me what they've done, I can't write the paper with them. And I can't raise the money with them. Because I'm not just sitting in my office waiting for a paper and waiting for money. I want to do my science. I'm addicted to chemistry. But I mean, what do you do to, to I understand you, but well, let me, I'm you getting there, I'm how, getting How do you balance uh, your own life with, with this, this big challenge? And, and, well, it's uh, very practical. Do, do, um, you, do, you, do you do sports or what? what do you yeah, do? but everyone said, I mean, a few weeks ago, I remember being interviewed by someone who asked the same question. And I used to have all this thing, I do all this, that, and the other's like, no, I don't do anything else. I sleep four hours a day, I work the rest, I spend some time with my family. And it's not quite as severe as all that. But what I'm saying, let me finish one point. I, the first point is very practical. So the problems are very practical, like you're having deep thoughts and then your glass breaks and there's water everywhere and there's crap everywhere. It's like, you've got to, you've got to clean it up. That's one thing. I'm at home, well, I like to watch the television with my wife. We like fiction. I run every day um, and I've got two kids. And um, I like to do stuff with them and I like them to challenge me. and. And as much as I'm always busy because I'm trying to raise money and writing papers, they're like, look, Dad, come on. You know, they're getting older. They're only going to be this age for a little while. And so I was fortunate enough to have children at a time in my life where everything could have gone off the rails, but they bring you back. There's nothing like a kid vomiting on your shoulder or telling you, <laughs> you know, you come, <laughs> you come in with some brilliant ideas and the kid just goes, no, not interesting. And it's quite funny because they're like, they don't know. 
okay, occasionally one of them uh, says something odd. Um, but they're smart and, and they're, they're just really interesting and I'm interested in them. But so um, I have big hobbies. Well, I do a lot. Of, I love computers. I love technology. I love hacking around. Same. Well, yeah, same I mean, but it is. I mean, you're trying to say that I, you know, paint or hand glide. I don't. I don't. No. I just but, don't. But